What's up, everybody? Islam Words Blanca, and we are back with another Yakuza Explained video. This time we are discussing Yakuza 4. As weak as Yakuza 3 was, the devs did a great job at putting the franchise back on track with number 4. The story is so good, but it also complicated as hell. If you struggle to keep up my Yakuza 0 explanation because there are two different stories, well, get ready because now we have 4. That's right, 4 characters of 4 different plot lines to confuse you more than Majima's inner thoughts. If you're one of those that can't spare 20 plus hours to play, or 5 hours to watch all of the cutscenes to fully understand this masterpiece, I got you. So here we are one year after the events of Yakuza 3, and for the first time in the entire series, we don't start as Kiryu. Instead, we are a moneylender named Akiyama. Magazine says there's a serial killer on the loose in Kamurocho, but fuck it, it's nap time. Hanachan, his secretary, starts blowing up his phone and starts nagging him to do his job. His lazy ass needs to go do collections. On the way, he spots Kido, a member of the Kanemura family, a small faction in the Tojo Shibata family. Akiyama loaned money to the family, so he decides to check in. Turns out a couple of Uena Sewa clan goons are at one of their bars causing trouble. Since the Kanemura are in the Tojo and the Ueno are cool with the Tojo, you'd think it'd be whatever, right? Wrong. They're on Tojo turf. They're disrespecting the family. They gotta go. But because Kanemura are a bunch of peasants, they must rely on Arai for everything. Arai is the family captain and Kido's Anaki. He's currently at Kamurocho Hills with the head of the Shibata family. You might remember that building from Yakuza 2. We then learn more about Akiyama. He lends money in a special way. There is a quote-unquote application process where the loanee must prove their worth by passing a test of character. Rumor is he doesn't even charge interest, which is absolutely unheard of for any kind of lender. While chilling with the homeless homies, Akiyama sees Arai with Shibata at Kamurocho Hills. They were trying to get evaluation on the property. Arai gets a call about the Ueno thugs, but Akiyama somehow beats him there. Our guy smooth talks his way into pissing them off. They try some shit. Leopard print boy gets a bottle straight to the head, and a Hawaiian shirt guy gets his ass whooped and dropped the old-fashioned way. Arai shows up conveniently late, and you can tell Akiyama holds a lot of respect for Arai. They must have some kind of history. Because everyone in the Yakuza universe lets their guard down way too soon, Ueno guy gets up, pulls a gun, Arai catches a bullet and Ueno guy runs away. Akiyama tries to track down the guy only to hear a gunshot go off behind his office and I put a bullet in this man's head. Dead as fuck and Arai's apparently doing okay considering he just got shot. Arai runs off and this random bum ass cop just casually walks up and starts putting fingerprints all over the body. Bum cop casually starts talking to Akiyama before more cops show up just in time to take the wrong guy to jail. Like they usually do in these games. Tokyo's finest added again. This is all going on while Hanachan is screaming at Akiyama like that's really going to help. We then get a quick flashback to a homeless Akiyama. Dude's sleeping again but wakes up and went BOOM! The Millennium Tower goes up in flames. It starts raining money and Akiyama starts collecting. If this looks familiar, it's because these were the events that took place during Yakuza 1, five years prior. And if that doesn't look familiar, go watch my other explained videos for games 0 through 3. I'll wait. No, I won't. Akiyama gets released from prison since Hanachan witnessed everything, but he gets stopped by Detective Suguichi before leaving. Suguichi basically says, stay away from the Kanemura Ueno feud. Shit's getting real. Akiyama's all like, I do what I want. And then Suguichi mic drops after saying Kanemura's been killed. What? Akiyama gets back, but then a mysterious woman in a trench coat shows up. Quick words to the wise, never trust the random chick in the suspicious trench coat. She used to work at a club called Drama Queen, and she wants 100 million yen within the next 10 days. One lump sum payment in cash, no guarantor, no collateral. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Literally, any lender on this entire planet would be like, bitch, you crazy. But Akiyama isn't any lender. He says he'll do it if she can pass his test, and they'll discuss that the following day. Before she leaves, he asks her her name. She gives him a fake name. Lily, you plan on giving this girl mad bread, untraceable, and she can't even give you her real name? This is way too sketchy, my dude. Akiyama gets a call and meets up with Kido. Kido's the one that found Kanemoto's body while looking for an eye. He was strolling into the HQ, and there Kanemoto was, laying there on the couch, dead with no shirt. Kido says the cops think it's a woman because he was missing his shirt, and he also had some lipstick stains on him. While they're talking, Shibata's goons show up, and they're not happy about the Ueno incident. 
They catch these feet because Akiyama is a kicker, and right when it's all cool, Suguichi shows up. He's all like, I told your ass to stay out of it, get your ass in jail, but Akiyama said, fuck that, and he's out. The next day, Suguichi shows up at Sky Finance. Akiyama is going under 24-hour surveillance because this incident is getting too real thanks to Katsuragi, captain of the Ueno Sewa clan. Daigo politely offers Katsuragi a pile of cash, and she bought his finger to make amends, but Katsuragi's not satisfied. Katsuragi says that he wants Arai's head or control of Majima's Kamanocho Hills project. For those of you that don't know, over time, Kamanocho Hills will be bringing in hundreds of billions of yen way more than the price of some lieutenant from a random peasant Yakuza family. But the Ueno won equal retribution, and the only Tojo lieutenant left after Yakuza 3 is Majima. Everyone knows that Tojo won't give up Majima's head, so his project is the next option if they can't find Arai. Lily shows up mid-conversation and starts her test with Akiyama. He's going to teach her how to be a hostess at his club, and she must make three million in three days. After the first shift, we decide to take the sketchy girl that won't give us her real name and wants all of her money, on a date. Really? Akiyama? Come on, dude. He ends up kissing her because she reminds him of an ex-girlfriend. That always ends well, and naturally we get interrupted by more Shibata goons. Goons catch feet, they escape, and we call it a night. The next day, we're talking with Kido, and I is still missing, and Kido wants to know why Akiyama cares about any of this. I kind of don't blame him. Akiyama says that he was a young hotshot banker five years ago, but was fired after being set up on some BS embezzlement charges. Akiyama spent literally all of his money trying to clear his name and ends up homeless. The Millennium Tower bombing that rained money was his saving grace, and he managed to pick up an easy mill that then helped him start his current businesses. But because mans can't catch a break that day when the Millennium Bomb went off, he gets jumped by some thugs. Adai is the one who saved Akiyama, and now he's trying to do what he can to support Adai in return. After failing to do collections again, Akiyama stumbles upon Drama Queen, the bar Lily says she used to work. Turns out it's a gay bar, so she lied about working there because they don't employ females. Hmm, that's pretty sus, so we go in and ask around, but no one's there. No one but a dead manager. Man's looking just like Kanemoto, except this time he don't have pants. Near the body, we find a Shibata family coat and lighters that look like the one that Lily had. She didn't do it, did she? We're naturally freaked out, so we run back to the office only to find Hana on the floor and the entire place trashed. She was talking with Kido when thugs from the Hasushiba clan pull up, pistol whip Hana, kidnap Kido, and steal Sky Finance's client registry. Hasushiba are helping Shibata with their dirty work. We fight our way through the gang, beat up Japanese George Michaels, and find out the registry was stolen because Shibata is trying to find Lily. Why is Shibata going after Lily if she has nothing to do with the Ueno incident? Our club calls us, looks like Lily made the money, so we call her to say we're going to give her the 10 mil on the roof of the Millennium Tower. We could have easily just had her come to our office or meet literally anywhere else, but I guess Akiyama likes a view. He gives her the money, but before they leave, man just straight up calls her out. Why did you kill them? Holy shit, Lily really is the serial killer? She killed Kanemura and the drama queen manager. The Shibata goons jumped them on their date because they actually wanted Lily and not Akiyama. But why? If Lily answers these questions and explains herself, she'll never have to pay the loan. But then she says Akiyama will get his money even if it takes her whole life. Come on, girl. We need answers. They say their goodbyes and she leaves. Get ready because this entire story is all about giving you one answer and a thousand more questions. We get a call from our club manager and some douche decided to take off his shirt and sing shitty karaoke. His name is Minami, is one of Majima's boys, and he's looking for Lily. He gets tight, Akiyama isn't snitching on Lily, so he wants some action. Guess what? He got that action and gets his ass whooped. Then Majima shows up asking about Lily as well. Finally, Akiyama gets some answers. Her name is Yasuko and Majima needs to keep her safe. But why though? Majima's trying to make amends for messing up 25 years ago in 1985. If you played Yakuza 0 or watched that explained video, this next scene might look a little familiar. Back in 85, Majima and his sworn brother Saijima planned to run a hit on Ueno leadership. At this point, the Tojo and Ueno were not on great terms. By the way, Yasuko is Saijima's sister, but that's not important right now. But what is important right now is that they're going balls deep, bag full of guns, not expecting to survive the next day is the hit and Majima doesn't even show. Saijima says, fuck it, pulls up extra strap like Neo in the Matrix. Wouldn't advise putting one in your mouth though. Don't think the Yakuza dental plan covers that. Anyway, he just starts lighting dudes up like pop, 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 pop. However, I do have a couple issues with the scene. 
first, Sueno literally just walked into a ramen shop. How the hell did they get their food so quickly? It takes me five minutes for someone to take my damn drink order, let alone serve my full meal. Second, how do literally none of these dudes have guns? And the one guy that has one, why does he wait until half his crew gets slaughtered or start shooting and miss all but two bullets that end up in Saejima's shoulder? What the fuck? Anyway, Saejima's fucked up the entire Ueno squad, black screen. And text roll tells us that Saejima was in the Tojo Sasai family. They prosecute Saejima and he gets the death penalty for murdering 18 people. As he awaits his execution 25 years later, he suddenly transferred to another prison in Okinawa. Hmm. First day in Okinawa and homie gets jumped by a bunch of Ueno. They get their asses tossed, but then Saejima gets his own ass kicked by a guard named Saito. The captain interrupts the beating and lets another prisoner talk to Saejima after taking a bribe. You can only imagine how filthy corrupt prison guards are in this universe. Prisoner might look familiar, it's Hamazaki from Yakuza 3. Yes, the same one that stabbed Kidu. Saejima learns he's at a nameless prison that's privately funded. Not even on the map, this prison specializes in detaining and getting rid of Yakuza. Yakuza. Then Saejima gets real upset when he finds out that Ueno are still around. He didn't actually kill his mark. The Sasai family crumbled after the incident. The Shibata family rose up to take Sasai's place. And Majima not showing up was all according to some plan. So you're telling me my man is on death row and spent 25 years in jail for literally nothing. His boss and sworn family got erased, replaced by a rival family, and was betrayed by his own sworn brother Majima? That's downright depressing. I feel for you, Saejima. Hamazaki proposes breaking out of the prison. It's not quite the Shawshank Redemption, but it's a plan nonetheless. Basically, Saejima is going to fight off all of the guards while Hamazaki sneaks out and steals some stuff from the warden's office. They'll scale the prison wall with a homemade grappling hook after talking about trust for way too long, causing Saejima to fight even more guards. And let's not forget how he will literally be inches away from freedom and almost not make it until Hamazaki saves him. Then they must swim across the ocean to Okinawa, but again, they talk for way too long about brotherhood and Hamazaki gets shot, of course. Real quick, where are all the snipers during this prison break? We beat down like 50 guards and only Saito had a nightstick, and then Saito decides to pull his gun out while we're on the wall. Like, come on. Hamazaki catches two more bullets to what look like vital organs, but somehow manages to tell Saejima to find Kiru and wrestle Saito off the wall. Yep. They gone. The next day, Saejima conveniently washes up on shore by Kiru's orphanage. Saejima tells his story, but for the first time ever, Kiru's all like, nah fam, not helping you get revenge. You need a good reason. Saejima says, fuck your good reason. Kiru goes, then I'll stop you. Saejima's all like, pull up. And for the first time ever, we are actually fighting the dragon of Dojima. Even though he just broke out of prison, swam across an ocean, and probably hasn't eaten a decent meal in 25 years, Saejima still has enough energy to lock Kidu's OP ass in a stalemate. Haruka tries to break up the fight, not her best idea, but then Saejima collapses. When he comes to, Saejima is given a bag that has clothing, money, and a note. Our man Kidu really came through for the homie. Funny how fighting someone teaches you more about them. Saejima is finally back in Kamenocho, and we need to find Sasai and figure out what the hell happened in the last 25 years. We stumble upon Kido and get him to tell us about the florist. After some tedious investigating, we finally find his awesome underground office, but naturally information comes at a price. Again, the florist has us fighting in the Colosseum. We win, but the information Saejima gets probably isn't what he was hoping for. Sasai's all kinds of fucked up. He's been homeless and losing it ever since the Ueno hit. The only reason he's even alive right now is because Majima brought him in for protection. Saejima gets back to his hideout and Minami's waiting for him and says Majima's trying to meet. Saejima's still trying to figure out if Majima betrayed him, so of course he's going. But before he leaves, Kido asks him if he regrets what he did 25 years ago. Saejima gives him a speech about Yakuza honor and duty, including his final lesson to young Kido, which was, you gotta go balls deep. To see Majima, Saejima had to fight off like 50 dudes, including Minami, and what does Majima do? Take him to the batting cages. After 25 years, Saejima is naturally impatient for answers and tells Majima to stop fucking around when he catches the ball with his bare hands. By now, we know the only way to get Majima to talk about anything, we need to beat it out of him. So we do. Majima believes himself, Sasai, and Saejima were all set up by Shibata. On the day of the hit, Shibata tells Majima that he's not going. Shibata claims there's a traitor in the Ueno who's feeding information to Sasai, and this entire hit was orchestrated by them and not the Tojo. Their goal is to start a war, and then the traitors would smooth things over peacefully to move themselves up the ranks of their respective clans. However, we all know Sasai is crazy and homeless, which means Shibata is full of shit, which also means Shibata is working with the Ueno, which also means he might have had a hand in the bullshit that's going on present day. 
This just got way more complicated, but it's going to get worse. Don't worry. Because Majima's a good dude, he's all like, fuck you, fuck that. I'm not sending my brother out there to die for nothing. Shibata sends like 20 guys to jump and detain Majima, who fights off most of them, but then ends up getting chained to a pole. Random goon starts talking shit. Badass Majima says he'd rather go blind than bound down to some bitch. So goon obliges the request and takes out Majima's eye. Silver lining, he gets to wear cool eye patches now. Remember Bum Cop from Akiyama's playthrough? His name is Tanimura, and now we get to play as him. Tanimura is a two-bit cop in the community safety division. What is very interesting about him, though, is that his father was murdered while investigating the Ueno hit 25 years ago. And now he's on a mission to find Yasuko because she was written in the dad's notebook. Tanimura finally gets a lead and finds Yasuko. Shibata goons show up. Why wouldn't they? Kidnap her ass. And now Tanimura has to fight his way to her. We find Shibata talking about his master plan with Arai? What the fuck? I thought Shibata was trying to take Arai out. Arai is working with Shibata, who's been working with Katsuragi this whole time. And the entire Tojo meeting was faked. Shibata kidnapped Yasuko because he has no idea why she's killing his men. Shibata then starts doing old man creeper shit when BAM! Holy fuck, Arai just shot Shibata? I thought he was working for him. But it was all just part of the plan, and he says they still need her. They being Arai and Katsuragi. Wait. And I's working for the Ueno? How many covers does this man have and what role is Yasuko playing in all of this? Again, one answer causes a million more questions. Finally, right before Shibata dies, we find out that Katsuragi was the Ueno trader that set up Saijima 25 years ago. Oh my god. Tanimura interrupts the meeting. He saves Yasuko, but Arai gets away. Yasuko says she never met Tanimura's father. He was killed before they could talk. All she was told was that her brother actually wasn't the real perpetrator, and the UNO shooting is bigger than some random Yakuza feud. Yasuko continues to explain she was contacted by the police, uh, collusion? And introduced to Katsuragi about saving her brother. She either needed to provide him with 100 million yen, or commit murder. This explains why she approached Akiyama and killed the Shibata members. Katsuragi is trying to silence anyone who might know the truth about the event 25 years ago. Yasuko heard her brother is in Okinawa, even though he's not, so she's out. Before she leaves, she tells Tanimura where the 10 million is, and he uses this to arrange a meeting with Katsuragi. Katsuragi confirms that he and Shibata planned every detail of the incident 25 years ago to rise through the ranks of their respective clans. Tanimura's father also found a police cover of the incident because Saijima didn't actually kill anyone. Wait, huh? The real killer came in and finished everyone off after Saijima left, and after Katsuragi double-crosses Tanimura, guess what? Katsuragi was the one that killed all 18 people. Oh, shit. Then with perfect timing for the first time ever, the cops show up. Specifically, Suguichi and Tanimura gets away. Hisai, Tanimura's captain, suggests going into the police archives to get more info on his dad's case, and they discover Suguichi was his partner. No! Suguichi's not in on this, is he? The next day, Tanimura decides to give the 10 million back and meets Akiyama again. They fill each other in on the shitstormer conspiracy that we're all experiencing. Then Akiyama gets a call from Kido. Remember Ueno dude in the leopard print shirt that got knocked out by Akiyama? Yeah, he's willing to talk as long as he can get some protection. Tanimura goes to meet the guy. He tells him they were ordered to cause the scene at the club. He also overheard Katsuragi say the murder of the lieutenant was all part of the plan. Then out of nowhere, BAM! Suguichi shoots the dude dead and he's about to kill Tanimura until got him! Bad cops show up and stop Suguichi. But not really because they're all useless and somehow can't touch him even though he just committed murder. Japanese cops below my mind in this game. Tanimura's out here like, this is stupid, screw the rule book, and goes after Suguichi on a boat. Not sure who conveniently left their keys in two boats right next to each other, but here we are. Tanimura finally gets to shoot the guy, who then admits to killing his father. As you would guess, that's the trigger for our man, so he proceeds to beat the shit out of Suguichi. Tanimura is ready to put a bullet in this man, but cannot understand why a good cop would go bad. Plot twist, Suguichi's loyalty was never to the police. He's been undercover Yakuza and Katsuragi's sworn brother this whole time. Fucking hell, man. This is getting way too crazy. Then we finally see it. 25 years ago, Saijima leaves the shop and Katsuragi wakes up because everyone who was shot was shot by rubber bullets. But how? 
The guns Majima gave Saijima were actually given to him by Shibata, and they were preloaded with non-lethal ammo. Katsuyagi decides to BOOM headshot everyone with real bullets, and Sugoichi comes through to put Katsuyagi in the hospital and write his fake report about the incident. One problem though, Chief Munakata, now Deputy Commissioner, is not buying his bullshit report and knows it's a cover. Or at least that would be a problem if Munakata himself wasn't corrupt as fuck. Munakata's in bed with Katsuragi, and the collusion now goes all the way up to the top of the police force. Suguichi finally has his redemption revelation and is ready to be brought to justice until BAM! This dude gets shot too? Killer gets away, but before dying, Suguichi says there's another traitor on the force. We then see Munakata confirm Suguichi's death with Hasai? No way, Tanimura's captain's in on it? He has Tanimura's family tied up because they know too much, pulls the gun, and all we hear is a gunshot from outside the restaurant where they're being held. He did it. Finally, after 12 chapters, we finally get to play our man's Kiru. Scene opens up to Morning Glory where we see Hamazaki? You got shot three times and tackled a guy into the ocean. How are you still alive? Because Kiru's a good dude, he patches up Hamazaki, who tells Kiru about the prison and the true story of Saijima's past. He then presents Kiru with a book he stole from the warden's office. It's a cash flow ledger that lists 10 billion yen that was supposed to go from the Tojo to Jingu and then to the prison. Oh my god. God, this corruption goes all the way back to Yakuza 1. Hamazaki learned all of this through his connections with the Snake Flower Triad, who were laundering dirty police money through foreign banks. Is this how Akiyama got framed? All of this money is going to the prison so they can bribe Yakuza to commit crimes, have the police quote unquote stop them, and then look good in the public eye. Kiryu's all like, why me? And Hamazaki shows him another entry in the ledger. The plan to destroy the Tojo. Give the Ueno control of Kamenocho Hills, which will then be transferred to the police. Remember when Katsuragi told Daigo it's at Ice Head or the Hills? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because Hamazaki's finally turning a new leaf, he decides to turn himself in. But before they can do that, they run into Yosuko, who isn't getting any help from the cops because remember, this prison doesn't technically exist. They have a chat but get interrupted by Saito and the prison guards who are chasing Hamazaki. As always, Kiru beats everyone down. He and Yosuko are headed to Kamenocho. Hamazaki stays to cover them but collapses from his wounds and ends up dying. Back in Kamenocho, we learn Hisai took his own life with the gunshot we heard earlier. The burden of being a dirty cop must have been too much. Akiyama says the DA are raiding his office and Tanimura has a plan to get to Munakata. Because why wouldn't he? The first thing Kiryu does in Kamurocho is go to Serena. And guess who's tending the bar? That's right, Date. What is with these two meeting at bars? Kiryu needs to find Saijima and gets a tip that he's already linked up with Majima. Kiryu heads to see Majima, but can't believe what he's seeing. Majima is getting arrested. Says Daigo set him up, and Yasuko is now in more danger than she ever was. Then we see Daigo speaking with Munakata, who's spewing some BS about how Yakuza and police have always worked in unison to preserve the balance or whatever. He says he can wipe out the Ueno if Daigo promotes Arai to captain as Munakata's liaison and gives him control of all Tojo operations. Munakata is trying to take over the Tojo now? Meanwhile, Katsuragi's beating up homeless people in the florist to capture Saijima. Katsuragi plans on getting Saijima, Yasuko, the prison ledger, and Sky Finance's 100 billion yen to take down Munakata. How does he know Sky Finance is rolling like that? What is Kido doing working with Katsuragi? Guess he's going balls deep like Saijima told him to. Kiru gets back to Serena and Yasuko is gone looking for her brother. She's being escorted by Akiyama and Tanimura who think Kiru is a bad guy. So they give her a gun to protect herself and tell her to go to purgatory while they stop Kiru. Uh, yeah, no, you don't stop Kiru. After Kiru whoops their asses, all three of them get to purgatory to find a beaten florist and a missing Yasuko and Saijima. They were both captured by Katsuragi and Kiru. They all go back to Serena. Akiyama's depressed because his 100 billion yen was stolen from the vault. Yes, 100 billion. That's a fuck ton more than what we're even thinking about dealing with in Yakuza 1. Akiyama suspects Kiru found the vault and the Ueno posed as DA in order to take it without going unnoticed. Kiru has a plan to trade the ledger for Yasuko, Saijima, and the money, but Katsuragi will only meet with Kiru if he can fight through literally the entire Ueno gang. Normally that would pose an issue, but not for the Dragon of Dojima. We meet Katsuragi at the top of Kamenocho Hills, and you know this won't end well. Remember the last time we were here? Yeah, 
I'm looking at you, Yakuza 2. Deals about to go down. No idea how they got that many briefcases. Also, not relevant, but it's snowing. Someone gets Sajima a jacket. This man's nips gotta be hard as fuck. Kido then pulls a gun the second he gets the file. It's over. Psych! Man literally does a 180 and shoots Katsuragi. I'm telling y'all, balls deep. Kido then reveals Arai. Another betrayal? Seriously? He gives Arai the file and BAM! Arai shoots Kido? His sworn brother? How many people is this dude going to double cross? Arai leaves. Sajima is the only one using his head at this point and double checks if Katsuragi really got shot. Good looks because he was wearing body armor. Then Saijima gets stupid and turns his back to Katsuragi and he gets himself shot in the arm. Katsuragi shoots again and holy fuck, Yasuko gets shot in the back trying to protect her brother. With a bullet in her back, Yasuko walks up to Katsuragi, talks forever about how it's too late for her because she's already killed people, and then uses Tanimona's gun to put a bullet straight through Katsuragi's head. Remember the last time her brother and sister were here? Yeah. She dead. The next day, Arai delivers a file to Munakata, but no money. Munakata gives Arai a gun, pictures of the Morning Glory kids, and says negotiate with Kiru for it. That's fucked up. And I think so too. So he takes the gun, says there's a code he needs to uphold as an officer of the law, and shoots Munakata. Wait, what? Huh? Arai's a cop? Kiru and friends are gathered at Serena. Their plan is to bait all major players at once with Akiyama's money. They say one final goodbye to Yasuko and roll up in style to Millennium Tower. Apparently, Yakuza members are the only ones that know how to tie a tie. All 100 billion is chilling at the top of the tower. Don't ask me how they had time to get it up there and stack it so nicely. Daigo rolls up, and I calls them out for using Kido against him. Wait, what? Kido's been working for the Tojo this whole time? Arai knew that, and that's why he shot Kido earlier. Arai also accuses Daigo of selling out the Tojo for money. Daigo says he's justified as sacrifices must be made to financially support the Tojo. Because remember, they've been bleeding money ever since Yakuza 1. But what about you, Arai? Fake-ass Yakuza police whipping boy? Hold up. Arai's not a whipping boy. Manson's been an undercover agent this whole time. He was originally sent by Munakata to seize control of the Tojo. But that all went to shit when Arai shot Munakata and he is no longer a cop now. Arai needs the money so he can bring his version of quote unquote justice to the world. But wait, there's more. Munakata's still alive? And he brought all of his boys with him. Remember when he gave Arai the gun that got him shot? Yeah. Those are fake bullets too. He wants the money for the same reasons as always. Take over the Tojo, fund the prison, do the whole fake crime scheme. Munakata is about to light everyone up when a helicopter shows up. Seriously, what is with these games and a helicopter in the final scene? But this one pulls the most gangsta shit ever because the helicopter blows all the cash away. Our heroes roll up in style, and Akiyama said it best when he goes, everyone pick an ass to kick. Akiyama ends up kicking the shit out of Arai, Saijima tosses the shit out of Kido, Kido punches the shit out of Daigo, again, and Tanimura finesses the shit out of Munakara and all of his men who have guns and knives. With the other three accepting their fate as what usually happens when you beat someone up in this game, Munakara is still convinced he can't be touched. Then another helicopter shows up, this time with Date and Sudo, they really like helicopters, and it starts right newspapers. Date is still a journalist and wrote a whole story on Munakata's corruption, including a copy of the ledger's evidence. You're done, famo. In a desperate fit of rage, Munakata jumps toward a gun at his feet. Seriously, when will they learn? Get the damn gun away from the bad guy. Gun goes off and Akiyama gets shot. Oh no. Just kidding, he's fine. He's ironically saved by the same money that's made his life hell the last five years. Munakata gets handcuffed, but they still didn't move the fucking gun. Sometime later, he goes for it again. Gun goes off. Black screen. Two weeks later, a newspaper article says Munakata used the gun to off himself. Better than being a dirty cop in a prison, I guess. Akiyama and the now skinny Hanachan go back to their old hijinks. Dante's back on the force with Tanimura, and Kiryu gets to oversee Saijima become the patriarch of his own family. And that's Yakuza 4. If you're still confused, I'm sorry I wasted your time. I mean, I'm not, but I did my best. This story is complicated as hell. What do you want? If you found this video helpful or at all entertaining, please be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. What other games do you want to see explained after we finish the Yakuza series? We only have two left. And after that, I need ideas for content that you'll actually watch. So let me know what you want to see. I plan on doing videos for the rest of the Yakuza franchise, like I've said before, and other games as well. But please bear with me. These videos take time. Some of these games I need to replay in order to get the full experience. And Blanca is a busy boy with a full-time job, young family, and a growing live stream. If you would like to hang out with us live on stream, join the family on Discord, or connect on any of the socials, 
All my links can be found in the description below. I'm La Muerte Blanca, and I'll catch you guys next time. Yoshi. Cool.